Welcome to today's ABC UTC Research Seminar. The presentations uh, in these seminars highlight research work at the ABC UTC's partner universities. Each seminar consists of a 40-minute presentation followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. My name is Mary Lou Rawls Newman, Director of Technology Transfer at the ABC UTC. I'll be moderating today's seminar. I will be assisted by Paul Lyles, former Georgia State Bridge Engineer, and Romeo Garcia with the Federal Highway Administration, both members of the ABC UTC Advisory Committee, who will be moderating the session. Ali Javid, PhD student at FIU, will be managing the web room. We're pleased to welcome participants at over 600 registered sites for today's seminar. Before we begin today's presentation, Atour Azizi Namini, director of the ABC UTC, has a few updates related to our upcoming conference. Atour? All right. Uh, thank you, Mary Lou. And uh, I'll be brief. All right. Fantastic. Uh, I wanted to share with our audience uh, important information about our upcoming uh, ABC conference that will be taking place between December 8 and 10, 2021. So it's just a uh, couple of months away from now. Um, this is a great opportunity to learn about the ABC and learn about the, what the rest of the world is doing in the ABC area. Uh, the conference is going to include uh, 16 16 uh, keynote talks. I'm just providing you with some examples just to give you some feelings about the types of the presentation that will be made. Uh, Eugene Bruweiler from Switzerland will be discussing use of the UHPC for bridge deck overlays for rehabilitation of the bridges and etc. That's taking place in the Europe. Um, Liang Zhu, who is a chief uh, engineer uh, with Shanghai Orban Construction Design, we'll be discussing some of the latest development in the ABC area in China, uh, example projects, the, the equipments that they have developed related to ABC, and some of the innovative concept related to ABC. Uh, Peter Collins of Sweden uh, will be sharing uh, development of uh, prefabricated uh, modular systems uh, composite for composite bridges in the in the Sweden suited for the ABC projects. Uh, uh, Mark Shelley from the Germany uh, is doing some uh, very exciting work uh, uh, related to the, the prefabricated segments that are post tension together in Germany. So he will be sharing, giving a presentation. So this is just some examples of the some of the keynote talks that will be given in total. There is a 16 keynote talks. Uh, that will be provided in the conference. The conference also includes a, a hybrid workshop uh, on ultra high performance concrete. So it's gonna provide an opportunity for you to actually see uh, what it feels like um, to mix a UHPC, discuss the various aspects of the UHPC structural aspect, and so on. It also provides an opportunity to see what other states who have developed a non-proprietary UHPC, what their experiences is and what their suggestions are. Uh, if you look at the conference program at a glance, uh, again, it includes 16 keynote talks. There's also 30 uh, technical presentation that will be given by speakers from uh, around the world. And don't forget that the, this conference focuses on international experiences. Uh, the program is going to be very live. So in between the program, the, you're going to have a chance to uh, listen to music of the world. Uh, so maybe this is a new for, uh, I guess, the engineering conferences. Uh, the, those who are exhibiting or sponsoring the conference will have a spotlight in between the technical presentation. Like we said, the UHPC workshop. Uh, there will be an award program um, uh, that will be given on several categories. Uh, there will be a reception uh, at the, the virtual reception. And also the, there will be opportunity to visit the virtually the exhibit halls. Uh, we are not going to be able to archive the 
the recording or the videos of the presentations on our website as we do for all our programs. So uh, don't miss the opportunity to listen to this, some of these exciting presentation. Uh, in 2022, December of 2022, we are gonna have our conference face to face. We have actually issued the call for abstract. And if you go to our website, you will see the procedure to sub submit your abstract for 22. Uh, uh, the conference. So again, the uh, the conference program is available. If you go to our website, you can uh, view the, the conference uh, uh, program. The registration is open and to assist us, uh, it will be great if you can register early. So Melu, uh, with that, let me turn it back to you. Thank you, Ator. We'll begin our presentation now. The seminar today features the ABC UTC research project on service life design guidance for UHBC Lynx Lab. <laughs> We'd like to thank Armin Mehrabi, Director of Research at the ABC UTC, and Musharraf Zaman, ABC UTC Co-Director with the University of Oklahoma for coordinating today's featured research project. We're pleased to, well, to introduce our presenters Royce Floyd, Principal Investigator, Clay Reed, Master's Student, and Jeff Volz, Co-Principal Investigator. Royce? All right, thank you, Mary Lou, and thank you all for this opportunity uh, and for being here today to hear a little bit about uh, some of the research work that we have going on uh, here at the University of Oklahoma, uh, specifically on the service life design uh, considerations for UHPC Lynx Labs. Uh, and I'd like to thank Clay for all his work on this project, as well as other students that have been involved uh, that we'll talk about a little bit as we go, uh, and as well as to Jeff for um, all his work on this project. So as we get started, uh, you know, one of the initial questions you may be asking yourself, uh, which, you know, a lot of you have probably thought about, but, you know, when we say service life design, um, you know, what exactly are we talking about? And the main objective uh, is that we want to be able to develop longer lasting bridges and to do that, we need bridges that are resistant to the environment and their uh, service conditions. Uh, we need bridges that are maintainable uh, and bridges that are adaptable uh, to changing use uh, over time. Uh, and there are some uh, frameworks that are out there uh, that have been developed uh, that have some excellent guidance uh, for the des designing bridges for service life. Uh, and one of those is the, the Sharp 2 R19A project that was on des a design guide for bridges for service life. Uh, that considered service life uh, at the design stage as opposed to just considering, you know, strength level, serviceability level in terms of, say, deflection, but looking at how long that bridge uh, could last and making decisions on methods for the specific conditions of the bridge to be able to increase uh, the service life of that bridge. And that might include, you know, specific materials, construction techniques, uh, new technologies that could uh, extend the life of the bridge. Uh, and there's also an NCHRP project uh, on development of guide specification for service life design of highway bridges uh, that provides the guidance on overall um, service life design of bridges, uh, whereas this project is focusing more on just the one specific aspect of link slabs. Uh, and so if we think about link slabs uh, as an individual item, uh, the motivation comes from the fact that in a lot of bridges, you know, we use simply supported beams. Uh, we have expansion joints in the bridge deck in some locations, construction joints in other locations. Uh, but there are a lot of possibilities for deterioration of the expansion joints. And we need those joints, you know, to provide thermal uh, relief for the bridges to move back and forth. Uh, but over time, those bridges can be impacted by traffic, uh, by snow plows, by freeze thaw damage, uh, and we end up seeing things that look kind of like these pictures, uh, where we have damage to the, the steel armoring, uh, we have spalling of the concrete, we have grade separation between uh, the two decks, which leads to more impacts, and eventually we have damage to the seal uh, of the expansion joint to where water can get through, uh, potentially laden with chlorides onto our superstructure and substructure. And you know, throughout Oklahoma, uh, we've seen instances where uh, we get the leakage through the expansion joints, it gets onto the beam ends, we start to see you know, discoloring, then we start to see uh, some spalling of the concrete, uh, deterioration 
uh, you know, going throughout the beam and eventually exposure of the reinforcement uh, and potentially even, say, breaking of some of the pre-stressing strands, which you can see here on the bottom right. Uh, as that water continues to go down through the structure, it gets onto the pier caps and the piers. Uh, and potentially can, you know, seep through the concrete, cause additional corrosion of the reinforcement in the piers, uh, which can uh, lead to concrete spalling and reduce the life of the overall bridge. So if we, instead of uh, having expansion joints at every piers, uh, we eliminate some of those joints, uh, create a sealant on our bridge, uh, we can keep some of the water from getting onto our beams, getting onto our substructure, uh, and potentially extend the life of our bridge. Uh, and so a link slab uh, is a flexible slab that's continuous over the piers uh, and can eliminate some of the joints. And here you can see an illustration uh, of an original expansion joint uh, that's been replaced with a link slab over the pier. And of course, we do need some expansion joints to allow for uh, movements of the bridge unless it's designed as an integral abutment. Uh, so we have to take that into consideration when we select joints for elimination. Uh, but our link slab allows rotation, so it's flexible enough to allow rotation, which can allow us to still design our beams as simply supported, uh, or if we're retrofitting an existing bridge, uh, that we can continue to consider those beams as simply supported. Uh, link slabs do um, get subjected to some stresses, uh, and so potentially we can have some cracking under loading, uh, which can lead to, you know, infiltration of water and things like that. So it's something that we need to consider in their design. Uh, but in general, they're debonded from the beams and tied into the deck slab so that we can create that flexible connection over the piers and not create a continuous connection, because uh, that's not what we're looking for in this case. Uh, link slabs were first examined uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, and kind of in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, there were some uh, very good design guidance uh, published in PCI Journal uh, that's been adopted elsewhere, uh, and uh, that's included in this reference of Kanner and Zia uh, that's also included in the reference list for this presentation. Uh, but for most of those link slabs, they were considered to be full depth, uh, made with conventional concrete, uh, and then over time, other materials have been used, such as in engineered cementitious composites, and then, of course, UHPC, which we're talking about today. Uh, UHPC, or ultra-high performance concrete, uh, has been developed over about the last 30 years. Uh, it's got a very high compressive strength. Uh, if we look at the FHWA definition, um, 21 to 22 KSI kind of as a minimum. Uh, but the, the more important things for Lynx Labs are the flexural strength and with steel fibers included in the UHPC, we get a post-cracking flexural strength that needs to be greater than 0.72 KSI to meet that FHWA uh, definition. Uh, but we also get very low to negligible permeability. Uh, we get a very high resistance to freeze thaw, a very strong bond to conventional base concrete, uh, very short reinforcing development lengths, and combining all these things together, we can get an excellent link slab uh, and potentially increase the service life uh, of our bridges. Uh, I have just kind of an illustration here of how the fibers uh, change performance. In the top picture, we have no fibers in the matrix. Uh, it cracks, it falls apart. Uh, in the, the second picture, uh, they withstood the same load, uh, but the specimens were able to hold together because of those fibers. Uh, just kind of, you know, continuing some general information on UHPC, uh, it has a very low water cement ratio, uh, an optimization of the particles within the mixture uh, to get a high flow ability. Uh, again, we have steel fibers, and those are typically included at about 2% by volume. Uh, Clay will talk about what happens if we have other percentages. Uh, and then we need a high mixing energy because there's no coarse aggregate. Uh, and you can kind of see that illustrated here on the right side in a high shear concrete mixer. Uh, where we have a powder to start with. As we mix that powder, it starts to ball up and eventually creates uh, a material with kind of a pancake batter consistency, uh, at which point we would add the steel fibers. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about non-proprietary UHPC in this presentation. Uh, and the question you might be asking is why you know, use non-proprietary UHPC when there are uh, great products that are out there? Um, and you know, sometimes the high compressive strengths of the high-end UHPC uh, may not necessarily be needed uh, for some applications, you know, like field joints and bridge decks or potentially link slabs. Uh, 
Uh, potentially, we can tailor the properties of the UHPC to our need. Uh, so, you know, the bond strength or the tension strength or whatever particular property is most important. Uh, and that has the potential to lower the material costs. Uh, and then there are, you know, some DOTs that see the, the proprietary nature of UHPC uh, providing some sole sourcing and bidding issues. Uh, and kind of the way I like to explain it is, you know, a Cadillac is amazing. And in some cases, you know, you want one, you need one, uh, but in other cases, you might be able to get by, uh, you know, with a base model, um, you know, Chevy pickup or something. So in looking at using UHPC for Lynx Labs, uh, it has the potential to create a partial depth connection instead of needing a full depth uh, Lynx Lab. Uh, and here uh, we show an example uh, retrofit detail for a Lynx Lab where uh, a portion of the concrete uh, needs to be removed instead of the entire depth of the slab uh, that then the UHPC can be cast uh, in a smaller volume. Uh, it takes less time uh, to remove the concrete, uh, which has some, you know, potential benefits as well. Uh, UHPC allows for shorter connections and debonded length, both in the splices into existing reinforcement, as well as the debonded zone uh, within the slab. Uh, and that can allow us to go from needing to debond 5% of the span uh, for conventional concrete link slabs, uh, plus the embedment on each end to make the splice uh, to a two to three foot total link slab using UHPC. Uh, UHPC also has those steel fibers holding cracks together. So instead of getting large cracks, uh, we can get small distributed cracks, which has the potential to reduce water infiltration. Uh, and that's relevant to ABC, uh, because we can get a faster replacement of joints, uh, potentially faster insulation because we're placing uh, less material. Uh, and then we can also have a very high durability of these uh, link slabs, which can limit repairs in the future. So the objectives of this project uh, were that we could develop user-friendly tools and guidance uh, that will allow use of information developed uh, specifically related to UHPC link slabs uh, and apply that information within the framework uh, that was developed by the SHARP 2 R19A project for surface life design of bridges. Uh, we also wanted to look at the uh, effects of service level loads on the durability of these link slabs. Uh, so how you know does a service level uh, you know, traffic load over time affects the durability, and Clay's going to tell you about that. Uh, and then at the end, to provide some educational materials that can help the practitioners uh, understand how to use this information. And throughout the project, you know, one of our main objectives was to leverage the research that's been done by the ABC UTC, as well as other state DOTs, uh, to provide this guidance. Uh, and you know, just to be upfront about it, uh, this project uh, has had a number of COVID-19 and equipment related delays. Um, we had some issues with students that had to leave the project. Um, we had some trouble finding students because of COVID. Uh, and so we're a little bit behind schedule uh, to the point that we've done our review of research and practice. And you'll hear a lot about that. Uh, our large scale testing is underway, uh, but it's not quite complete. Uh, we've completed the loading of the specimens uh, and they're being prepared uh, for some longer term testing. Uh, and we'll you know, tell you all about that here in just a little bit, uh, as well as preparing the training materials. Uh, we still have a little bit to go on those once we finish the other testing. Uh, and then, you know, as part of an offshoot of this project and some other projects, uh, the Oklahoma DOT uh, is planning for a possible link slab implementation uh, in the next year or so uh, that we would potentially be involved in to do some monitoring and in-service uh, evaluation. All right, so I'm going to talk just a little bit more uh, and then hand it off to Clay, um, but talk a little bit about some of the other students that worked on this project and their review of current research and practice on the topic of Lynx Labs and UHPC Lynx Labs. Uh, we've done a lot of work looking at previous research uh, on UHPC, and I'm just going to provide a quick snapshot here uh, of typical proprietary UHPC properties uh, to give you some context. Uh, and uh, typically, we're going to get a compressive strength for these materials somewhere around 24,000 PSI, uh, a direct tension cracking strength uh, just over 1 KSI, so about 1.2 KSI, uh, split cylinders and flexural cracking strengths or MORs, uh, modulus of rupture tests uh, lead to about 1.3 KSI cracking strengths. Uh, we have, you know, a very low chloride ion permeability for these materials. Uh, some of those you have to test without the fibers uh, because of electrical resistance. 
uh, and then uh, very good freestyle resistance for UHPC just kind of in general. Uh, in terms of looking at Lynx Labs uh, and reviewing, you know, kind of what's been done out there, uh, there's a lot of um, kind of general guidance that's available on design of Lynx Labs, uh, but kind of the behaviors that we're looking for uh, are that we get a pin connection at the level of the slab. And so instead of having all the rotation at the bearings, uh, that rotation kind of moves to the slab point. Uh, it creates a cap over the beams. Uh, to prevent the ingress of water and corrosive agents. And even though we may get some cracks, uh, we don't get that large opening like what we see uh, for an expansion joint. Uh, the link slabs are still able to transmit the thermal loadings uh, axially along the length of the bridge. Uh, and then, you know, we're looking to limit the crack widths just like what we try to limit for anything else uh, to less than 0 0.013 inches due to flexure. Uh, we have a couple of illustrations here, you know, showing that we still get movement uh, in the trans uh, or translative movement uh, in the direction of the bridge, uh, but rotation at the link slab. Uh, and then again, seeing that we can eliminate some of those joints, place link slabs over the piers. Uh, based on a study done uh, in 2019 and 2020, uh, about 30% of state DOTs in the U.S. have implemented link slabs in one form or another. Uh, and that might include just research, uh, it might include field work or research, uh, and it might include kind of standardizing things uh, within the state specifications. Uh, and if we look more in detail in that to some specific states, uh, you know, Virginia, uh, Massachusetts, and New York kind of have done the most in this area uh, to the point that there are uh, some of the requirements that are standardized into their specifications and have specific design procedures uh, for link slabs. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, we have uh, a length of somewhere between five and seven percent of the span uh, with some minimums, um, you know, depending on the state. Uh, the concrete that's used varies from Virginia using, uh, you know, a more traditional conventional concrete, uh, Massachusetts using a high early strength concrete, uh, New York using both uh, high performance concrete and UHPC. Uh, but in all cases, they have a bond breaker uh, over the pier, um, some connection to the slab reinforcement, whether that's a lap splice, uh, a non-contact lap splice, or uh, grouting bars into the existing deck. Uh, and there's potential for these to be used on new or existing bridges. Uh, and we've seen that states have gone uh, either direction with those. Uh, so, you know, we're talking more about service life. Uh, in this project, but in general, the d design of a link slab uh, is going to be such that we assume the stress uh, caused in the link slab is distributed along the debonded length. Uh, we're going to use a tensile cracking stress <coughs> based on the strength of the material. Uh, New York DOT uses 1.2 KSI and a maximum tension strain of 3,500 microstrain. Uh, the UHPC has an allowable compressive stress of 14 KSI uh, in their design procedure. Uh, we then sum the internal forces considering UHPC providing tension resistance, uh, determine the UHPC and steel strains based on the girder rotations and the unbonded length, and then compare the actual stresses to the applied stresses uh, and kind of work those out to get to where we're below uh, the allowable stresses in the link slab. Uh, just a couple of typical details, um, both taken from uh, kind of New York drawings, uh, but in this case we have uh, a conventional concrete link slab. Uh, you can see that there's uh, about a 3.75 feet debonded zone on either side of the joint, and I will say both of these are for steel bearings. Uh, this was for a case that the entire deck was replaced, so it's almost like new construction. Uh, you then have a transition zone at each end uh, where the link slab is tying into the existing reinforcement. Uh, and for the conventional concrete slabs, uh, we see a full depth uh, replacement, a full depth link slab, and the debonding at the bottom of that link slab. Uh, for a UHPC replacement, um, typical detail, uh, in this case, the entire depth is removed around the support. Uh, the bottom half is replaced with conventional concrete, and then the link slab is placed on top of that. Uh, it's also possible to only remove a partial depth of the concrete. Uh, but in that previous link slab, we were about nine feet from end to end. Uh, for this link slab, it's about three feet uh, from end to end, including a one-foot debonded zone, and then an anchorage at each end of that link slab. 
All right, so from here on, I'm going to let Clay take over uh, to talk about some of the sources of distress we've seen that can affect the service life of Lynx Labs, uh, as well as you know some of the properties of the materials, uh, and then to talk about his large-scale testing program. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Um, so for here, several sources of distress that can potentially affect the service life of Lynx Labs were identified during review of previous research. Uh, a significant concern is the degree of cracking in the link slab and bridge deck over the piers, which can be affected by an improper design of the link slab stiffness. If the stiffness of the link slab is such that the girders cannot rotate properly, substantial cracking may occur in the link slab. If the link slab is stiffer than the surrounding deck slab, this cracking may not occur in the link slab but may incur in the adjacent decks. An inadequate debonded length between the link slab and girders may also result in slab cracking that can reduce the life of the link slab and deck. Uh, improper bearings for the girders at the link slab locations can also lead to distress if they restrain lateral movement and rotation of the girders. Concrete deteriorate, deterioration can still occur even in the absence of cracking in the link slab. The resistance to chloride ingress and freeze thaw performance of the link slab materials are important considerations for service life. Understanding how the available materials and link slab configurations perform relative to these potential distresses is important for selecting a combination that will lead to the desired service life. As part of our ongoing work sponsored by Oklahoma DOT and the ABC UTC, our team has examined many of the properties for a specific non-proprietary UHPC mix that has that have potential to affect service life of UHPC link slabs. This mix design is termed J3, as it was the third mix design examined in the J series of mix design iterations. UHPC tension strength is an important consideration for UHPC link slab design, and this slide shows a comparison of tension strength results from direct tension, splitting tension, and flexural tension, or MOR, testing relative to fiber content. In all testing, we examined 0% steel fibers to provide a baseline for the matrix, even though this would not technically qualify as a UHPC since it has no posting crack behavior, post cracking behavior. In most other testings, we use the typical 2% steel fiber content along with 1%, 4%, and 6% fiber contents for comparison. It can be seen here that the First tensile crack stress in the direct tension test is fairly consistent across the fiber percentages in that it is primarily controlled by the matrix. The maximum tension strength for all tests increases with increasing fiber content up to 4% steel fibers, after which there is a slight decrease, likely related to the consolidation of the mix. We examined freeze thaw durability and chloride penetration first for a conventional Oklahoma DOT class A bridge deck concrete, a typically proprietary UHPC and the J3 non-proprietary UHPC mix. We then looked just at freeze thaw durability for the non-proprietary UHPC with varying steel fiber content. For the rapid chloride Ion permeability test, we only examined the matrix since the test uses an electric, electrical current and the fibers would short circuit the test. We found that the proprietary UHPC had the best performance with a negligible charge passed, but that the non-proprietary UHPC exhibited a very low classification with only 63 coulombs passed at 56 days of age. Both UHPC mixtures exhibited significantly less charge passed than the conventional deck concrete. The freeze thaw resistance for the class AA concrete was very good in terms of relative dynamic modulus, 
but both UHPC mixes with 2% steel fibers had an increase in dynamic modulus over time. The same was true when the fiber content was varied for the non-proprietary mix, with each fiber percentage exhibiting excellent performance. These results indicated that the fiber content had little impact on the freeze-thaw resistance of the material itself. However, a UHPC links lab or UHPC connection also includes an interface between the conventional concrete and the UHPC. Bond test results not presented here indicated good bond between the UHPC and conventional concrete, but composite UHPC and conventional concrete specimens were tested for freeze-thaw resistance to examine, to examine the effect of this interface on freeze-thaw durability. Conventional concrete specimens with an exposed aggregate finish were first prepared and then the J3 non-proprietary UHPC was cast alongside the base concrete to create a composite specimen shown here on the bottom left. These composite specimens were then subjected to the ASTM C666 testing protocol. A 0% fiber specimen is shown here because it was the only fiber percentage to show, to show damage in the UHPC and for these specimens the damage consisted of transverse cracks across the entire specimen shown here after 150 cycles and at the end of the test. Even for the 0% fiber specimens, the interface between the UHPC and conventional concrete did not exhibit separation or damage as shown in the right side of the slide. And for all other fiber, contents, the majority of the damage occurred in the conventional concrete. The graph shown here presents the specimen resonant frequencies over time. All specimens except the 4% and 6% fiber specimens eventually exhibited enough damage that it was no longer possible to obtain a frequency measurement, but again the majority of the damage to these specimens was in the base concrete. In addition to the durability and performance of the UHPC material and interface with the conventional concrete, an important consideration for performance of the Lynx Lab is the bond between the connecting reinforcing bars and the UHPC. Two series of comparative pullout tests were uh, conducted to examine the effect of steel fiber content on the bond of reinforcing bars cast in the non-proprietary UHPC and a series of beam splice tests were conducted to obtain more realistic bond stress values for typical, typical configurations. The pull-out test specimen was based on a method used in previous research, but had to be modified to include a very small 2D sub B or two bar diameter bonded length to ensure splitting failures did not occur. The same two bar diameter was used for the beam splice tests. These graphs show pullout strengths for number five and number eight conventional uncoated grade 60 reinforcing bars. Again, the 0% fiber specimens were included to obtain a baseline value, but many of the 0% fiber specimens still failed due to splitting, even with the short embedment length. So adding even 1% fibers significantly increased to pull the pullout strength. Adding additional fibers increased the pullout strength in general, but little gain was seen after 4% for the number five bars and after 2% for the number eight bars. This graph shows pullout loads for epoxy coated number five bars with varying fiber contents. Again, the pullout load increased significantly from the 0% fiber case when 1% fibers were included, but little gain was seen for additional quantities of fiber, primarily because most specimens failed to do, failed due to separation of the epoxy from the reinforcing bars. This effect of the epoxy can also be inferred from the lower pullout loads compared to the black steel bars.
The beam splice test consisted of two number five bars with a two bar diameter lap splice at mid span to create a more realistic bond stress condition. The beams were then loaded to failure using a third, third point uh, load arrangement. In general, the non proprietary UHPC specimens exhibited this. Uh, distributed cracking along the length of the beams while the proprietary UHPC specimens exhibited fewer discrete cracks. All splice beam specimens exhibited similar load versus deflection behavior, especially early in the loading. It can be seen that the proprietary UHPC specimens with 2% steel fibers exhibited the highest loads in corresponding uh, bond strengths that were an increase in bond, bond strength when the fiber percentage increased from 1% to 2% for the non-proprietary UHPC. Understanding the individual behaviors presented here is helpful in selecting details that will increase service life of a UHPC link slab, but one of the objectives of this research was to examine how service level loading and any resulting cracking could affect the corrosion potential and freeze-thaw resistance of a full-scale link slab specimen. This portion of the project will be discussed in the following slides. So for our tests, we constructed four specimens, two link slab joints with a class AA concrete and two with the J3 non-proprietary UHPC. As a reminder, class AA is the standard concrete mix for bridge decks used by the Oklahoma DOT. The design of the link slab connections were based on a New York State DOT detail for new construction. The detail calls for a 10 inch deck, but we modified the proportions for an eight inch deck. Here's what our specimen design looks like. Uh, it includes two spans representing bridge decks connected with a link slab. The test specimen ends up being eight feet wide and six feet across. The link slab is partial depth with the spans having a two inch gap between them. We decided to go with the design of a link slab for new construction, although our tests will also be applicable to retrofitted link slabs. Here's a more detailed look at the profile of the specimen. Note the debonded section. This will allow the connection to behave more like a simple span end than a continuous connection. The New York State DOT detail calls for a compressed synthetic sheet gasket for the bond breaker. We were actually able to purchase and install the same bond breaker used by the New York State DOT. As mentioned, we use the class AA concrete and J3 non-proprietary UHPC mixes for the connections. The class AA mix has a water cement ratio of 0 0.37 and included coarse, coarse aggregate up to 1.5 inches in size. Uh, the J3 mix, again, was developed at OU. It uses much a much lower water cement ratio and includes masonry sand, silica fume, slag, and high range water reducer. The J3 mix included 2% steel fibers, which is a which is very typical for UHPC mixes. When constructing the specimens, the panels were prepared first using the class AA concrete. Four specimens, two spans each for a total of eight panels. Each span had two layers of number five rebar in both the longitudinal and transverse directions. The rebar the rebar was not epoxy coated. This was chosen as a worst case scenario as uncoated bars will be more susceptible to corrosion. And in the event of a repair of older bridges, the existing rebar will likely not be coated. These were cast upside down so we could use foam inserts to shape the connection outline. The photo on the right shows the formwork form insert and all the rebar tied in and ready for the concrete to be poured. About six inches of rebar of what would be the top layer of rebar was extended into the foam to be spliced 
to the adjacent spans rebar later on. The picture on the left is one of the panels after being cast, removed from the formwork, formwork and flipped upright. The foam was removed, leaving the rebar exposed as seen on the right photo. The surface came out almost too smooth, so all the surfaces that were going to be part of the connection interface were sandblasted to roughen up, to roughen them up, uh, to promote a better bond. To prepare for the connection pour, two panels were placed together with their openings facing each other. A two inch spacer was placed between the panels. The sheet gasket was cut and placed along the flat portions of the panel connection outline and gap. To make sure the gasket did not move during the pour, a small amount of silicone was applied to hold it in place. The bond breakers seen in the photo on the right weighed down by cylinders as the silicone cured. After the bond breaker was placed, the exposed rebar was spliced together with more number five rebar with number four bars tied in along the width of the connection, all in accordance with the New York State DOT detail. Three of the splicing pieces had copper wire wire soldered to them to prepare for corrosion testing as seen in the left photo. Once all the rebar was tied in, the copper wire was taped down for the pour to prevent the wire from being covered in the pour or being pulled out. The picture on the right shows one of the J3 mix connections just after it was poured. For this research, we wanted to examine the effects of in-service loading on each material. To do this, one connection of each material was subjected to cyclic loading to simulate in-service loading, in this case traffic. Due to mechanical issues with the testing machine, we decided to limit the number of cycles that, pl that place the joint in compression as this loading required a greater force and was not necessarily critical to the behavior of the joint. We flipped the specimens to te test the connection surface in tension, the most critical loading. For this test, the specimen was supported at its four corners and a steel beam was placed along the gap to distribute the load along the link slap length. The specimens were subjected to 100,000 cycles from 1,000 pounds to 5,000 pounds and back to 1,000. The cycle count was determined so we could get enough loading to damage the specimens if they were going to damage. After tension loading, the specimens were then flipped back over for compression tests. They were supported at the connection ends along, along those edges, and the steel beam was rotated 90 degrees to have the slab bend about its other axis. The base load for each cycle stayed at 1,000 pounds with the peak load reaching 18,000 pounds, which is the cracking load for the AA mix. Again, due to technical is mechanical issues, we only performed 20 cycles for that high loading as compression loading of the joint is not necessarily critical to its performance. Once this was done for both specimens, we now, we now have one loaded slab and one unloaded slab for each connection material. Just a reminder, this is as far as we've gotten with this research due to COVID and mechanical setbacks. What we, what we will do next is cut sections from all specimens for accelerated corrosion and freeze-thaw testing. All cut surfaces will be epoxy coated to prevent corrosion on surfaces that would not be exposed during service. Now for the corrosion tests, a 12 inch by eight inch by six foot long section will be removed from each specimen with the cuts perpendicular to the slink slab. We'll make sure a copper wire is part of each specimen, specimen and all sections will be placed in a shallow pool of 5% saline solution. The surface top will be placed down into the bath as this surface is where the cracking will be most severe 
as well as that which would be exposed to chlorides on an actual bridge deck. An electric current will be passed through each specimen and solution. Looking at the photo on the right, the current will run through the copper wire to the reinforcing steel within the specimen, which will act as an anode, and then through the concrete pour water solution to the saline bath, then through the stainless steel rod, which will act as a cathode, then back to the power source. Tests will run for about 10 weeks with periodic che test checks on uh, corrosion status about every one to two weeks to check. Small windows will be cut into the concrete at the rebar in areas above the saline solution to see if it is corroding. Keep in mind, not only are we comparing the performance of each material, but we're also checking the effects of whether or not the specimens were loaded. From previous research conducted at OU, similar tests were carried out for repaired composite specimens. These are two composite specimens, one class AA mix and one J3 mix. Here you can see the pockets that were carved out to check on the corrosion state of the rebar. These are the same specimens with close-ups of the window cut at the interface of the two materials. From these, you can see the J3 connection on the right fared a lot better than the class AA mix. Uh, it is also important to note that no halo corrosion was present in the J3 mix, which is a, a common issue when exposing rebar for repair. Now for freeze-thaw testing, two smaller sections of each specimen will be cut. A court in accordance with ASTM C666, these sections will be submerged in water in a freeze-thaw machine as seen in this picture. They will be taken through 300 temperature cycles at a rate of two to five hours per cycle with each cycle going from 40 degrees Fahrenheit down to zero degrees, then back up to 40 degrees. Within every 36 cycles, we will remove those specimens and take a reading of their fundamental transverse frequency. This information will help us keep track of any changes to each section's modulus of elasticity. During these recordings, we will also note any physical changes to the specimens. Here are two specimens from previous research looking at a class A, class AA, and J3 specimen. After testing, you can see just how pocketed the class AA specimen became, where it appears the J3 specimen is unaffected by the testing. This is also noteworthy as the J3 mix was not even air entrained. Uh, now Dr. Bowles will close us out with information on the education module and conclusions. Thank you, Clay. So we're going to take all of the information that we were able to obtain from other DOTs, examples, and other research on Lynx Labs, combine that with the testing that we performed and developed education materials for practicing professionals. They would include things like tech briefs, pre-recorded videos showing important considerations for Lynx Lab designs, typical details, and whether they've been successful or unsuccessful in the past, and most importantly, examples of how to design the Lynx Lab in terms of sizing it and making sure that it behaves properly. All of that material will also be folded into our guide for the design of UHP Lynx Labs with surface life considerations incorporated into the framework of the SHARP report, as well as example UHPC design, UHPC mix designs uh, for non-proprietary mixes. In terms of where we stand, as both uh, Dr. Floyd and Clay mentioned, UHP Lynx Labs exhibit less cracking than conventional concrete due to their high strength, high tension resistance, and high tension strain resistance. If we can decrease the amount of cracking in the Lynx Labs, we're going to get significantly improved durability and performance. UHP Lynx Labs also require much less concrete removal which means the repair and retrofit can be done faster on existing bridges and accelerate the time in which traffic can be returned to the bridge and decrease the interruption to the traveling public. 
UHPC has negligible chloride ion permeability and excellent free thaw resistance, so it will behave very well in terms of long-term performance. And non-proprietary UHPC also shows no halo corrosion. Halo corrosion, again, is, as Clay had mentioned, is when you place fresh concrete against much older concrete, that difference in alkalinity content can actually cause existing steel and the existing sound concrete to start corroding. We did not see any of that in the non-proprietary UHPC accelerated testing. In terms of future work, uh, actually at the end of this week, we started saw cutting the specimens to make the freeze-thaw, full-scale freeze-thaw specimens and the uh, large-scale corrosion tests. We have almost completed the saw cutting and we'll be placing those materials both in the freeze-thaw chamber and in the accelerated corrosion tests next week. We will complete the training materials, which again will include design examples for working professionals so they can design their link slabs to behave well. And we're currently working with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation on a possible field implementation project in Oklahoma where we'll be able to monitor the performance of these link slabs over time. Here are some of the references uh, that we've used for our research and that we will include in our educational materials as well as our service life design guide. And with that, we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks to Royce, uh, Clay, and Jeff today for your interesting and informative presentation. Paul and Romeo will now moderate the Q&A session. Paul? Uh, thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, we uh, have a bunch of questions that came in during the presentation. We had some that came in beforehand. So uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get into the questions. Uh, the first one uh, that I kind of wanted to ask was really one that came in, in uh, early, and it says, uh, how is the service life design different from, uh, say, uh, ASD, allowable stress design or working stress design? I guess I can take, one, take that one. So the, the service life design uh, includes that you have a good design for, say, uh, ASD or LRFD, so the, the strength design is going to be, you know, the same idea. It's got to be strong enough to, you know, protect the public. Uh, but the service life design considers, you know, what details, materials, methods can be used uh, so that we don't have issues with, say, you know, having to go in and replace that joint, you know, in five years or, you know, 10 years or 20 years, maybe we can push it to 50 years. Uh, and, you know, that's often looked at in terms of, say, when's corrosion going to be initiated in reinforcing steel? Uh, you know, how long after that uh, are we going to have to replace that element? Uh, and how can we push that further into the future? So it's considering items other than strength uh, to, you know, come up with the best uh, design to last a long time. And that may be looking at life cycle cost. Um, you know, re rather than initial cost. Uh, so the initial cost may be higher, but the benefit over time is better. Okay. Now we had some questions that came in uh, just uh, on design and stuff. And the first one I have, uh, this is beforehand. Uh, when retrofitting multi-lane bridges, how does uh, one handle the vibrations from the adjacent uh, lanes that are that are still open to traffic? Any thoughts so, on that? So uh, it's a good question, uh, and it, it's going to be very similar to uh, any other, you know, staged construction like that in terms of, uh, you know, the effects that those are going to have on the material as it's going to set. Um, you know, from the projects that I've been on where we did staged construction, um, you know, we didn't really make any specific difference or changes to how we uh cast those materials uh and there were no uh, like we didn't see any detrimental effects uh from the vibrations uh, of the traffic on the open lanes okay um one that came in beforehand are you utilizing small diameter rebar to increase the flexibility of the link slab connections with the adjacent concrete deck all right so uh not necessarily uh, for that reason. Uh, so the, the flexibility um, differences are primarily based on the, the geometry of the, the link slab. Uh, the rebar that we're using uh, was based on uh, the deck, like so matching what was in the deck, at least in that direction. Uh, and then 
uh, in the other direction, it wasn't necessarily uh, to reduce the flexibility. Uh, but using small diameter bars does allow for you know smaller splices and connections. Uh, so there is some benefit for doing that. And just, just to add to Royce's comment there, in terms of cracking, more frequent smaller bars better control the, the thickness of the cracks than large diameter bars. So it'll also include the, improve the performance over time. Okay, we had a question that came in beforehand on what is the behavior of the UHPC under different conditions? And I was thinking environmental conditions and maybe under loading or something like truck loads. Any so comments? Hopefully some of some of that we covered uh, in this, you know, in the presentation. Uh, but you know, the, the UHPC behaves very different structurally because you get the tension resistance from the fibers. Uh, so you're able to count on that in your design where for conventional concrete, we, you know, ignore the tension resistance of the concrete. Uh, so you, you get that contribution structurally. Uh, and we've looked at a bunch of different applications, um, you know, say for connections, uh, full size members. Um, we've had some really interesting results with repairs where, you know, the, the UHPC bonds really well to the existing concrete. You then get the tension resistance from the fibers, and so you can get a capacity increase uh, in your specimen. Uh, you know, for other properties, the, the permeability is really low. The freestyle resistance is really high. Um, the reinforcing development length is, is very small. Um, so it, it has many characteristics that, say, outperform conventional concrete. And, okay. You know, that's good. Uh, there were a number of questions that came in uh, both beforehand and during the presentation about having any available reference calculations for uh, link slabs. Also, can you provide access to link slab design guidance, code of practice, and so on? And you mentioned maybe that's coming in the future work, but uh, uh, but you want to comment on that? So the, there are some, some good references uh, already existing on design of, say, conventional link slabs, as well as uh, some items on UHPC link slabs. Uh, some of those are included in the references that'll be in the slides that are posted. Uh, we'll post some links to some of those in the, the response to the questions. Uh, and then, um, you know, we're going to put some of that into our guide. Our intent for this project was more on the service life related issues rather than the, the structural design. Uh, so we we weren't planning to put as an extensive or as extensive uh, a section on that, but it sounds like we may need to to add some some pieces to our specific document. But we'll for sure get those links uh, included in the the posted answers to these questions. Maybe some people ask for some, maybe some uh, design examples with calculations. Well, so the, there are some of those out there in those references. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the ABC guide spec has some information on uh, UHPC Links Labs. That paper by uh, Canner and Zia has some example calculations. Uh, and then one of the references we have from the New York DOT has some example calculations as well. Uh, and we'll we'll get those out there. Okay. Uh, some questions that came in uh, before, I mean, during the presentation. Has the feasibility of debonding materials uh, uh, other than a synthetic sheet gasket been considered? Maybe maybe even like a chemical debonding agent or something. So, I think Clay, do you have any input since you searched for some of those? Uh, they weren't really considered. Like we did start to consider them but once we were able to actually get a hold of the sheet gasket that was called out in the in new york state dot detail we figured that it would just be better to stick with that for our design as that it's more applicable for that particular detail okay uh there was a question does uhpc require additional cooling similar to mass concrete so it depends on your definition. Uh, you, you do want to keep the temperature down. So you often, uh, depending on the ambient temperature, you often will replace some of the mixed water with ice to keep the temperature down. Uh, so it is kind of similar to mass concrete. It's not necessarily needing to cool it in place. 
you know, especially for these thinner placements, you know, maybe if you were doing a thicker section, that would be necessary. Uh, but it is important to keep that initial temperature down. Uh, and so ice is often used for that. Okay. Uh, here is a question that came in during the presentation. Uh, what work have you done to establish the rotation uh, and forces that link slabs should be designed for, uh, other than maybe what's in the literature? Uh, so we, we haven't really done anything in that area beyond what's in the literature. Okay. Um, a question came in before uh, during the presentation about how do you seal the interface between the link slab and the bridge deck? So that's a good question. But the, the UHPC, uh, we anticipate a strong enough bond between the two of them uh, to create that seal. Um, do you guys have any other input on that one, Jeff or Clay? Yeah, I mean, we've done a bunch of bond tests between UHPC and, and regular concrete and different kinds of interfaces and preparation methods. And UHPC just has a tenacious bond to concrete. So I think that joint uh, will, will most likely be tighter than any cracking that you would actually get in the link slab near the point of rotation. Okay, uh, a couple questions here that came in about uh, maybe existing stuff, but do you have plans to research in-service link slabs and their performance? We hope so. Uh, we're, we're working with the state DOT in Oklahoma uh, on some potential implementation projects uh, that hopefully uh, will be able to happen in the next year or so uh, that we would be involved in to monitor those in-service, uh, be able to see how they perform you know, in a, in a real situation. And the, the one that we're looking at is an interstate bridge. Uh, so it would have, you know, some pretty significant exposure, at least to traffic loads. Okay. Were there comparisons to typical link slab details using standard cast in place concrete with uh, F primes of C around four to five KSI? So we, we did compare to conventional concrete. Uh, we had some limitations on the size of specimens that we could test. Uh, so, calling it a typical detail for the conventional concrete may be a stretch, uh, but we were trying to get a comparative performance to a typical conventional concrete detail so we could see how, you know, the, the full-scale UHPC specimens compare to a full-scale conventional concrete specimen. Okay. Uh, here's one that came in during the presentation. Uh, in the 90s, uh, ECC link slabs were constructed with success. Have you reviewed ECC as a better solution to cracking uh, issues? The ECC is engineering cementitious composite, sometimes called bendable concrete. You wanna comment on that? Uh, so all, all I can say about that is we have evaluated that as part of this project. So we did look at some of the work that was done with those uh, in the past. Um, you know, that, that that will be included as one of our, we'll say service life alternatives uh, in this case. So we're not, we're not necessarily trying to say you should use link slabs in all situations all the time, or sorry, UHPC for link slabs in all situations all the time. Uh, we're trying to provide guidance on what the, you know, different options are uh, and what the implications of those would be. Uh, and so, you know, there there is some discussion of, you know, the, the different alternatives uh, in our work. Okay. Have you seen any studies on UHPC sleeper slab joints? I have not. Okay. I have not, I have not seen anything. I, I, I'm not sure I would put it in a sleeper slab. I don't think you get the benefits of it. Okay. Here's an interesting question that came in. Uh, are you, um, are the presenters aware of any UHPC link slab deployments in high seismic areas in the United States? Hmm, I've not seen any in high seismic areas. Okay, uh, question that came in beforehand was uh, what ADTT, that's average daily truck traffic and ADT, average daily traffic, Maybe salting and vehicle loads are used for projections of the link slab performance. 
Uh, so in terms of service life, you know, that's going to be bridge specific. So the, the traffic is going to be based on, you know, the bridge that's being designed. Uh, and then for some of those other items in terms of, uh, you know, chloride levels, et cetera, there's going to be some judgment involved based on the location. Uh, and, you know, that's going to be entailed more in the, the service life design framework. Uh, it's going to be based, um, like I say, location use, that sort of thing. So, you know, is it over water? Uh, is it in an area that receives, you know, large amounts of de-icing salts or is it in, uh, you know, the, the dry, hot desert? Like, it's going to be based on those conditions. Okay. Um we had one, a uh, couple of them that came in about uh, uh, the fixity of the bearings. And uh, one of them was with fixed shoes at all bearings, would link slabs be the appropriate solution to provide better de detailing and performance? Or are expansion shoes a, a requirement for link slabs? So to get the expected performance of the link slabs, uh, you would need the ex expansion bearings at the link slab location so you can get the lateral translation uh, as well as the rotation uh, so something like you know slotted bearing plates on neoprene pads okay um it's uh, getting to be 10 after uh i'm gonna ask uh uh romeo if we've got some questions that came in during the question and answers romeo are you there hi yes uh, uh thank you paul and uh, since we have uh, a lot of research questions here, uh, we are we can go till 2:30 on another 20 minutes. But uh, those that have to leave, uh, by all means, uh, uh, please uh, uh, we you can catch up later with uh, the, uh, the the on the website whatever is presented there. Uh, but uh, yes, there's there's uh, a number of questions that have come uh, later. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me pick a few here. Uh, did the uh, UHTC design uh, use micro or macro fibers? And are there any domestic producers for these fibers? As as I as I know, many uh, uh, or from overseas. So uh, I can answer that if Claire or Jeff want to chime in. You're welcome to. Uh, so we were looking at a, a half inch. Uh, I think 0.2 millimeter diameter microfiber. Uh, they were so that we've used a couple of different ones over time. Uh, the ones that we're using currently are manufactured in the U.S. Uh, and we've compared their performance to the ones that we used to be able to get that were manufactured in the U.S. Uh, and we haven't seen any significant difference. They have the same basic material specifications. Um, about a 300 KSI tension strength. Okay, uh, thank you, Royce. Another question, uh, do contractors need to be trained for placing the UHPC uh, link slabs? Clay, what do you think? I don't know if trained is the right term. Uh, I would say just mostly just uh, they just need to be aware of how mostly just like this rate at which it'll set and just how it's a lot has a much higher flow ability so they need to keep that into consideration when they install it okay yeah, so thank you there is a lot a lot different for uhpc than other materials that contractors do need to be aware of and clay has got to experience those things Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, are there any written specifications for construction of UHPC link slabs? I guess you're you're developing this. I imagine part of your work. So we we are working on some of those items. Uh, there is some information in uh, the ABC guide spec uh, as well. Um, you know, some of that points back to some of the work in previous literature on conventional link slabs uh, and you know part of this work is trying to fill the, the gaps okay thank you is the another question uh, is a bond breaker 
dirt are compressible and is the wheel load designed to span the, the bond breaker length and not just the, the opening gap? So, I mean, I would say it is compressible to some extent, but it is pretty thin. Uh, you know, the wheel load dimension is going to be smaller than uh, the link slab, so you would be potentially putting um, a load over that area, but it's going to have a, a very small deflection, the bond breaker. Okay, thank you. Another question here. Um, using a cementitious material with sufficient uh, tensile strength to, to eliminate the bonding entirely being, being considered? I have not. Thank you, that's good. So um, another question here. In terms of the design, how do we consider the link slab in our models? Do we consider them as, as nonlinear longitudinal links that will be defined as working in tension compression only? So if I, if I understand the question correctly, yes. So they're intended to be, but it's it's intended to carry longitudinal tension compression, uh, but to be free to rotate. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, well, this is a very straightforward question here. On, uh, slide 48. When do you anticipate the training material to be ready? Oh, so I, um, that's a good question. Uh, so, you know, we we want to make sure that all of our uh, experimental testing is completed, uh, which we believe should be by around the beginning of the year. Uh, so early next year is what I would say on those. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, and. Uh, and I would like to invite Paul back if he, if he has a question he wants to ask in particular. Uh, but otherwise, um, let, me, let me look for another question here. So is it applicable in cold weather conditions like Minnesota or Wisconsin regions, uh, for example? So applicable, I would say yes. Uh, but considerations would need to be made, you know, to account for those things, as in, you know, you don't necessarily want to cast them when it's 20 degrees below zero, just like any kind of construction. You would you would want to, you know, uh, pay attention to when you construct them. But in terms of performance in those conditions, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So here's another question that just came in. Um, with high modulus of elasticity of UHPC, how do you see a link slabs as a feasible, uh, a rather uh, flexible element? Uh, so it would be re related to, you know, having the debonded zone uh, and the thickness of the, the section. So, you know, you can almost think about it kind of like a short, flexible beam uh, and even though you have a high modulus uh, for that section the you know geometry is going to control that flexibility thank you and um, another question uh, during freestyle cycle how would the link slab behave without crushing the existing uh, bridge slabs Hmm. I'm not 100% sure that I understand the question, uh, but you know, in theory, that in terms of temperature differentials, you would take it to act as a unit together. So you get the uh, um, thermal movements axially um, transmitted through the link slab uh, into the decks and uh, superstructure. Uh, so that it, it would move together as a unit and also the need for those uh, bearings that can translate uh, at the location. 
Yeah, the, the coefficient of thermal expansions of the UHPC is very similar to regular concrete, so there's not a big differential between the two. Okay. Uh, this may have been uh, answered in, in some fashion earlier, but um, how does the vein slab accommodate thermal movement due to expansion and contraction? Yes, so that, that would be kind of like what Jeff was saying. You know, the, the coefficient of thermal expansion should be the same. It's attached to the existing slabs. Uh, so it, it would almost be like instead of each span moving independently for thermal movements, uh, you would have, you know, maybe two spans together moving uh, as a unit for thermal movements. So the link slab is intended to transmit those in the, the direction along the length of the bridge. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this again may be a related question, but let me ask it. Uh, uh, can you please provide more information on why restraining the lateral movement at the bearings can cause serviceability issues in the link slabs? So the the design of the link slab is to transmit the rotation to the link slab itself. The center of rotation becomes the center of the link slab, so it just accommodates the tension compression. And if the bearings are not free to move, it's going to the girders are going to want to rotate, and then you're going to be stressing or tensioning the uh, the link slab as as a tension element or a compression element. So you you need the bearings to slide to get all of the rotation centered within the link slab or you're going to get stresses way too high in the length lab and crack it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So here, here's a question. It's a little bit uh, long-winded, but I'm going to try to shorten it here. So um, what is what is the real purpose of the link slab? Is it to restrain the longitudinal displacement of the superstructure and, and therefore use the link slab as a structural element that would withstand to the stress is generated by the longitudinal restraint, or the link slab will play the exact role as the expansion joint by allowing the, the, lo the longitudinal deformations of the superstructure. So if I understand correctly, uh, or if I understand the question correctly, the, the link slab is intended to basically connect the two spans, allow each span to act as a simple span, uh, and to keep water out of that joint. Uh, it's still going to allow the lateral movement, so you have to have expansion somewhere uh, within the bridge. Uh, so, you know, you may take a bridge with, you know, five spans, and instead of having a joint at each span, you have a link slab at, you know, three of them, and expansion joints at the ends of the bridge. Um, so the, the thermal movements can still be accommodated, the beams still act like they're simply supported, but you are protecting each of those joints from uh, water getting into the, the superstructure, almost like you're creating a jointless bridge or, you know, like an integral bridge, uh, you know, just trying to decrease the number of joints on the bridge. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to, uh, at this point, um, um, turn it back over to um, Mary Lou uh, Ross. I think uh, we've gone long enough uh, with the presentation, but thank you, every. Uh, thanks so much for excellent uh, responses to those questions. Okay, very good. Thanks again to Royce, Clay, and Jeff for sharing your ABC UTC research work at the University of Oklahoma and for your excellent responses during the Q&A session. Thanks also to Paul and Romeo for moderating the Q&A session, to Ali for managing the web room, and to all participants for your interest and attendance and your great questions. This has been a very good Q&A session. This concludes today's seminar. Thank you.